We'll examine the problem of the two degree of freedom system shown. Two masses are riding along a frictionless surface. We'll call them mass 1 and mass 2. Mass 1 is connected to the wall by a linear spring of stiffness K1. And mass 2 is connected to mass 1 with a spring of stiffness K2. An external load F of T is applied to mass 2. The coordinate systems X1 and X2 are shown. And from a previous problem, we've shown that the stiffness matrix can be written as so. K1 plus K2 minus K2 minus K2 and K2. And the mass matrix can be written M1, 0, 0, M2. For the purpose of this problem, we're going to make some assumptions. We'll assume K1 equals 3 and K2 equals 2. And this is just arbitrary, except that I used it in a previous problem, so I want to stick with it. And also in that problem, we assume that mass 1 was 2 and mass 2 was 1. Call this equation 1, 2, and call these equation 3. Let's put a box around this. All right, so in solving the n degree of freedom problem, we take the equations of motion and we make the assumption of simple harmonic motion, and that yields the so-called characteristic equation. In the case of an n degree of freedom system, it looks like this, that k minus omega squared n times the vector x1, x2, that's the magnitude or the amplitude of vibration, and that's equal to zero. Call this equation four, and this is something known as the eigenvalue problem. It's a very important problem in structural mechanics. What we discover is that for non-trivial solutions, we don't want x1 and x2 to be zero after all. What is required is for this to be zero, only that's a matrix, and when we say that the matrix is equal to zero, really we mean the determinant is equal to zero. So this is the eigenvalue problem, and we say for non-trivial solutions to the eigenvalue problem, the determinant of k minus omega squared m must equal to zero. And you can think of determinant a little bit like a magnitude. So if the magnitude of that is equal to zero, then x1 and x2 can be of any magnitude. We'll call this equation 5. So turning the page, we need to solve for the determinant of k minus omega squared m equals 0. And that amounts to substituting equations 1, 2, 3 into equation 5. Okay, 1, 2, and 3 into 5. So we write that the determinant, and this is just plugging in the numbers, of 5 minus 2 omega squared minus 2 minus 2, 2 minus omega squared, is equal to zero. And then for a two by two matrix, we take the determinant as the product of the diagonals, five minus two omega squared times two minus omega squared minus the product of the off diagonals. So that's four net minus four equals zero. We call this five and we call this equation six. Okay, and then just multiplying it out, it's 10 minus 9 omega squared plus 2 omega to the fourth minus 4 equals 0. We can rewrite this as 2 omega squared, excuse me, 2 omega to the fourth minus 9 omega squared plus 6 is equal to 0. Using the quadratic formula, we can solve for omega 1 and 2 squared. The roots of that are omega 1 and 2 squared equals 9 plus or minus the square root of 81 minus 48 over 4. And we can just separate that as 9 minus the square root of 33 over 4 and 9 plus the square root of 33 over 4. If we take the square root to find the frequencies, we find that omega 1 is approximately equal to 0 0.9021 radians per second, and omega-2 is approximately 1.9199 radians per second. But the expressions above for omega squared actually give exact solutions. Call this equation 7, equation 8 and 9, and we'll number these equation 11. Oh, I'll number 11 and 12. Eigenvalues, we'll put a box around that because we're going to use those for later, and the frequencies, we'll come back to those later. Let's put a blue box around those. This is 10 and 11. 
10. Okay, so we've got these frequencies. And a reminder, what are these frequencies about? Let's go back to the previous page. These frequencies make this, the determinant of this, go to zero, which means that this is not a trivial solution. Okay, that can only happen at these frequencies. Turning the page. So next we have a look at the mode shapes. And in order to examine the mode shapes, we go back to the characteristic equation, which, where was it, number four, and we now substitute the known values of omega squared, or the eigenvalues in there. Because these equations are the same, remember the determinant of that matrix is zero, which means the top equation and the second equation are really just multiples of one another. That's what it means when that determinant is zero. So it doesn't matter which equation we can pick. So arbitrarily, I pick uh, minus 2x1 is equal, or plus 2 minus omega squared times x2 is equal to 0. And solving it in terms of x1, x1 is equal to 1 half of 2 minus omega squared times x2. We'll call that equation 13. Okay, so the first mode, uh, a reminder from the page before that omega 1 squared is 9 minus root 33 over 4. That was equation 8. And uh, that was the eigenvalue, which is the frequency squared. Let's just put a little box around that. And because both of the equations are the same, we don't have two equations and two unknowns. So we have to pick either x1 or x2. And in effect, by picking x2 equal to 1 arbitrarily, I've given now a second equation, and therefore I can solve equation 13. So substituting it in, I've got x1 is equal to 1 half times 2 minus, and now I'm just going to put the omega 1 squared in there, and that's 9 minus root 33 over 4, and that's equal to 1 half times minus 1 plus root 33 over 4. And I can write that now in vector form. Minus 1 plus root 33 over 8 and 1. It's obviously not normalized, but we don't care about that. That is my first eigenvector. And I remind you that omega 1 was a frequency corresponding to 0 0.9021 radians per second. So at that frequency, this is the mode shape. And I'll explain a little bit more about mode shapes in a second. Let's give these some numbers. 14, 15, 16, and let me just put a little box around this. Okay, good. Let me do mode 2 here because I want to do it on the same page. So for mode 2, we take the second eigenvalue, and that's omega 2 squared equals 9 plus root 33 over 4 this time. Again, we pick x2 equal to 1. And we substitute equation 9 into equation 13, and we get x1 is 1 8 minus 1 minus root 33. It's just the same with a sign change. And that means that the mode 2 shape can be written minus 1 minus root 33 over 8 and 1. And a reminder that omega 2 squared is 1.9199, almost twice the frequency of omega 1. Let's give these numbers 17, 18. 19. And just to give you a feeling for this, this is 0.593, because I don't have a feel for what minus 1 plus 33 over 8 is. And this is negative 0.843. So the first mode is a positive mode. Both values are positive, which means that the amplitudes are positive at the same time. And in mode 2, the one amplitude is positive while the other one's negative. So the first mode is a symmetric mode, and the second mode is an anti-symmetric mode. Let me put some boxes around this. These are your frequencies, and these are your eigenvectors, or your mode shapes. Oh, equation 12 is missing. Turning the page. So just to expand on this idea of eigenvectors and modes, in the case of the first mode, you have both amplitudes that are positive. One is slightly smaller than the other, x1 being the smaller one. And in the second mode, the one is the negative of the other. In each of these modes, both x1 and x2 oscillate with the same frequency. In mode 1, 
you can see that the oscillations have the same frequency. And in mode 2, even though the oscillations are opposed, they have the same frequency. So in mode 1, the two masses are moving to the left or to the right simultaneously. And in mode 2, they're moving apart or together simultaneously. And I remind you, some neat facts about eigenvectors include that they are orthogonal, that they span a vector space, that they represent principal directions. And this whole idea of orthogonality, probably a lot of you are still thinking in terms of 90 degrees to one another. You've got to get out of that way of thinking because it's very limiting and you can only limit yourself to three dimensions. Orthogonality should be thought of as motion is decoupled. Motion in one direction is completely decoupled from motion in an orthogonal direction. And this will apply in all different vector spaces. Or that the dot product is zero. There's no component in one in the direction of the other. That's a much better, better definition of orthogonality. So the idea is, is that a little bit of eigenvector one plus a little bit of eigenvector two can be used to describe all motion within this space. In a similar sense, we can look at the Cartesian coordinates and in the xy plane, a particle that's moving, that's located by a vector r, that will have a y component and an x component. We call the y component j and the x component i. And uh, so the same way as you can think of adding a little bit of x and a little bit of y to map any motion, you can add a little bit of eigenvector 1 and eigenvector 2. So you could think of the eigenvectors almost like the unit vectors i and j. For the remainder of this video, I'm going to return to some code that I produced in a previous video. The link to that appears above if you'd like to take a look. And using that code, we're going to simulate various features that we've discovered in this video. Here is that video, and if you go down to the description, you can click on the final code repository, and this is that code. And what we're going to do is run a few tests using this code. Let me collapse a little bit of it just to neaten it up. We don't need to look at any of this right now. And for our first test, I'm just going to give it an initial displacement. And the initial displacement will just be 1, 0. And let's run this. Make the screen a little bit smaller. And you can see it's a combination of two modes. Neither oscillation has the same frequency. The red block and the blue block get to the equilibrium points at very different times. Now I'll remind you that the modes that we found earlier in this video, let me just paste them in here, look something like this. Make it a little bit longer, wider. So mode one occurred when the frequency omega, this is actually the frequency squared, it should be the square root of this. And same thing here, this should be the square root. That's the frequency that we showed earlier. And those correspond to the two mode shapes that I'm showing here. Okay, the one is uh, 1 plus the square root of 33, excuse me, minus 1 plus root 33 over 8. And the other one is minus 1 minus root 33 over 8. So let's substitute one of these mode shapes now. Take this one here. Of course, the displacement of mass 2 is just equal to 1. And then we need to import it up here from numpy import sqrt. Put sqrt, and now we can run this. So when we give it initial displacement that corresponds exactly to one of the modes, then we find both masses oscillate with exactly the same frequency. They cross the equilibrium point at exactly the same time. I'll just continue that way. So by displacing it in accordance with the mode 1 displacements, what we've done is we've triggered that mode, and that mode will vibrate at that frequency that we've given, approximately 0 0.9 radians per second. We can very easily put in the second mode shape by switching this sign to a negative and running that. 
And now you'll notice we've stimulated the second mode. This is an anti-symmetric mode, so the, the masses are moving in different directions at the same time. But once again, with exactly the same frequency. They cross the equilibrium point at the same time, and both masses are oscillating at the same frequency. Although now we've triggered mode 2, which is a higher frequency of approximately 1.9 radians per second. Now, if we go back and we make these initial displacements zero, and now we give the forcing function some magnitude, let's see what happens as we bring the frequency up from very low. And a little bit faster at 0 0.5. and even faster still at omega equals 0 0.75. And now it seems that we're getting closer to the point where we're triggering the first mode, although it starts and picks up speed and then just dies. Similarly, if we increase the frequency a lot more to 1.25, this would be somewhere in between the first and second natural frequency. making it a little bit faster, increasing omega to 1.5 and then increasing it to 1.75 we can see we're getting close to the point that we're triggering the second mode although not quite Now if I make the frequency much, much higher, let's just say 5, I remind you that the second natural frequency is about 1.9. We notice that at such a high frequency it has almost no effect. We can see mass 2 oscillating very quickly because of the applied direct load, but not a lot of displacement of the two masses. In fact, even if we make the magnitude 10 times higher, 1000, still not a whole lot of reaction in terms of the displacement. Now what we'll do is reduce the magnitude by a, a hundred times down to 10 and for omega we'll use one of the natural frequencies. Let's use the first one. So omega is just the square root of 9 minus root 33 over 4. And what we find is when we force the system, even with very small magnitude, at its, at its fundamental frequency in this case, but at either one of its natural frequencies, we stimulate that mode. Both the masses are moving in unison, and they're being excited at exactly the frequency they want to move at. As a result, we see resonance, where the displacements grow linearly over time. These displacements will continue to grow until the system fails. Similarly, if I try to excite it with the second natural frequency, we find once again we've excited it in one of its natural modes, only this time it's the second mode, the anti-symmetric mode. But once again, even with a, a force of such a small magnitude, the displacements continue to grow without bound, ultimately resulting in system failure. For any other vibrations, it's a combination of modes. As you can see here, once this is given a little bit of time for the transients to die out. Anyway, that's all I want to say on this topic. I hope you found something useful in this video. If you have, please go ahead and hit those like buttons. It will really help me out. Or better still, subscribe to the channel and be notified of all new video releases. Remember to hit those bells. If you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you in the comments section below. Thank you very much for watching, and I will catch up with you in the next video.